welcome everyone. Thank you so much for attending office hours today. Um, we are um, glad to have two guest speakers today um, presenting their scientific work um, utilizing Workbench uh, data. So um, today we have Dr. Julian Acosta, uh, who's a neurologist currently working as a postdoctoral research fellow in the lab of Dr. Falcone at the Yale School of Medicine. Uh, Dr. Acosta received his MD magna cum laude from the National University of the Northeast in Argentina. And his research interests include the use of clinical data, genomics, radiomics, and novel modeling tools like machine learning to better understand the underlying bi biology of stroke. We have Audrey Leisure, who's a fourth year medical student at the Yale School of Medicine, also working in Dr. Falcone's lab. She graduated from Johns Hopkins University with honors and a Bachelor of Science degree in neuroscience. Her research focuses on the impact of cerebral small vessel disease on the response to treatment and secondary injury in intracerebral hemorrhage. Both of these uh, researchers have several publications on um, the publications page and one of my colleagues can post that in the chat. If you're interested in reading their papers, they've posted several in journals such as Stroke, the Journal of the American Academy of Dermatology, the International Journal of Dermatology, and the most recent uh, Cardiovascular Health Disparities in Racial and Other Underrepresented Groups, Initial Results from the All of Us Research Program is the topic of the presentation today and was recently published in the Journal of the American Heart Association in August of this year. We are very excited to have them present to you today. I ask that you please hold questions until the end. We will leave 15 minutes or so at the end for questions, um, but feel free to post them in the chat at that time. So I would like to then turn it over to Dr. Julian Acosta and Audrey Leisure. Thank you very much for uh, the kind introduction. Uh, so I am Julian Acosta. I'm a postdoctoral associate at the Department of Neurology at Yale, and I'm going to co-present uh, our work uh, with Audrey, who is a stellar uh, medical student from Yale, but also uh, an incredible scientist and an impactful scientist. Uh, already at this point. So our talk today is going to be about cardiovascular disease epidemiology, disparities and risk factors uh, using the All of Us research program. Uh, a couple of disclosures, Audrey is supported by the American Heart Association Medical Student Research Fellowship, and I am supported by the Viewer Fellowship in Hemorrhagic Stroke Research uh, from the American Heart Association. So we have been working with all of us for over a year now, and we have several projects undergoing, including the one that we're presenting right now, but also we are working on several things like a stroke outcome uh, across underrepresented groups. And we are also looking at biological age uh, and stroke risk. But the focus of today's presentation from my part will be uh, this paper that was published on the Journal of American Heart Association, uh, looking at cardiovascular health disparities in racial and other underrepresented groups. So we know uh, for previous research that racial and ethnic underrepresented groups carry higher burden of cardiovascular disease, uh, not only in, in means of stroke risk and, and myocardial infarction risk, but also uh, they often carry worse cardiovascular health metrics, like, for example, cardiovascular risk factors, lipid levels, um, glycated hemoglobin levels, uh, and so forth. Uh, but there is much more limited data on other uh, underrepresented groups defined by other factors. Fortunately, the All of Us uh, framework now allows us to investigate disparities uh, across these broadly defined underrepresented groups. And these broadly defined uh, underrepresented groups include, uh, of course, race ethnic groups, but also uh, depending on age, disability, sexual and gender minorities, education and income. So the goal of our project was to evaluate cardiovascular health disparities in underrepresented groups defined by this novel framework from all of us. So, of course, we use data from the All of Us Research Program, including participants of 18 years old and, and older. And for our analysis, we only kept participants that had available electronic health records data 
or uh, past medical history survey data in all of us. We define underrepresented groups based on self-reported race ethnicity. And in this case, we combine the variable race and ethnicity in, into just one variable. And ethnicity, in this case, Hispanic ethnicity superseded race. So we classify those as Hispanic or Latino, uh, regardless of race. And then uh, the, the race ethnicity was defined by the different race selected by the participants. We define underrepresented groups based on age, uh, according to age greater than 75 years old. Uh, those that responded that needed uh, help to carry, carry everyday activities uh, for physical disability. Then we also define those with less than high school degree for, for education and less than $35,000 of annual household income uh, for income category. And finally, we also define sexual and gender minorities for those participants that identify a non-straight, uh, uh, transgender, or non-binary in the surveys. Most, our results involve not only an adjusted analysis, but also we uh, use adjusted analysis. And for the adjusted analysis, we included covariates that are the most frequent cardiovascular risk factors, including hypertension, hyperlipidemia, and type 2 diabetes that were identified using OMOP codes. Uh, but we also included smoking status that was identified according to the survey questions and body mass index that was, was calculated using the physical measurements uh, done by, by all of us. For the outcome, we use a composite outcome of coronary artery disease and a stroke, uh, both ischemic and hemorrhagic strokes. And the ascertainment of this was using two main methods. The first one, using validated algorithms to uh, ascertain these this diseases in electronic health record data using ICD-9 and ICD-10 codes. And we also use the affirmative response to survey questions for each of these diseases. For the statistical analysis for unadjusted comparison, we use uh, uh, chi-square and t-test, and no one and Matt Whitney, uh, depending on the of the variables if they were discrete or, or continuous variables. And we use univariable and multivariable logistic regression to calculate odd ratio. Our primary analysis was a complete case analysis. So um, participants with missing val values for the variables were uh, dropped from the model, but we also conducted sensitivity analysis using multiple imputation. And because we are also interested in looking at modification as effect by cycle adverse, we also test, tested for interaction using product terms in the regression models. Moving on to the results here, uh, we can see the baseline characteristics of the population that we evaluated. And as you can see in the number of participants across underrepresented groups, uh, this is a, a very interesting uh, group to look at because even though white participants are still the, the, the majority, there is a um, uh, important proportion of participants that were, for example, Black and Hispanic, or, or Hispanic in this case. And the first takeaway that we saw in our data was uh, the amount, the proportion of patients with uh, vascular risk factors across minority populations. So as you can see here, Black participants had higher proportion of hypertension and type 2 diabetes and high proportion of, of smoking as compared to white participants. And the same is true for other underrepresented groups, including, of course, people older than 75 years old and people with uh, disability. And of course, also is uh, this is something that we can see in uh, persons with less than a high school degree and those with uh, lower household income. So this is a pattern that we saw across the study that these people from under underrepresented groups had higher uh, had worse uh, cardiovascular health by these metrics. And now uh, I'm going to look at the unadjusted prevalences uh, in our study. So this is including all participants. And a couple of patterns uh, emerged that are interesting already here. Uh, the first, of course, is uh, something expected, that is people older than 75 years and old and people with disability have uh, much higher prevalence of uh, cardiovascular disease. 
But what I think is, is most interesting from this unadjusted prevalence is when we uh, subanalyze this uh, fever uh, by sex. So just to, to recapitulate, so in the, in the x-axis, we have the, the different uh, underrepresented groups. On the y-axis, we have the prevalence. And in this case, we also have uh, determined the, the sex of the participants uh, by females uh, with the circles and males with the uh, triangles. And a couple of in interesting points uh, can be seen in this figure. So first of all, when we look at race ethnicity, you can see that even though that within males, uh, white participants were the ones with higher uh, cardiovascular prevalence, within females, black participants were the one that had higher cardiovascular uh, burden. And another interesting point here is when we look at participants by income. So as you can see that uh, in, within males, those with higher income had higher prevalence of cardiovascular disease, but within females, those with lower income had higher uh, prevalence of cardiovascular disease. And not, uh, not so high, no, not different in this case for disability, but there's a still a wider gap among females uh, than among males. So th those kind of patterns emerge when we look uh, at these differences across uh, sex. And now uh, I'm going to talk about the adjusted uh, results. So these results are coming from multivariable regression adjusting for age, sex, and uh, cardiovascular risk factors, the one that we mentioned before, which include hypertension, hyperlipidemia, uh, diabetes, smoking, and body mass index. And the first thing that we can see is something that is expected according to previous uh, results is that Asian participants and Hispanic participants had lower uh, cardiovascular prevalence compared to white participants. Uh, but the other important results here are that black participants and Person from other race ethnicities had higher prevalence, adjusted prevalence of cardiovascular uh, disease. Uh, somewhat expected also persons with higher age, age like greater than 75, and persons with disability also had higher prevalence of cardiovascular disease. And persons with lower income, importantly, also had higher adjusted prevalence of cardiovascular disease. Something that was a little bit Counterintuitive is that in this case, our results indicate that persons uh, with less than high school degree had lower cardiovascular disease as compared to those with higher education, even though the results for the cardiovascular metrics were worse. And now uh, I'm looking at the same results, but in this case, uh, stratifying by sex and the same interactions that we saw in the figure uh, that I explained before are seen here too. Uh, in adjusted analysis. And we can see that uh, Asian females uh, had lower cardiovascular uh, disease as compared to white. And in the case of Hispanic Latinos, this effect was mostly seen in male Hispanic Latino participants. And most importantly, in accordance with what we saw at the figure, black uh, females had higher uh, cardiovascular disease uh, prevalence as compared to white uh, females. And this was not seen among uh, black males. Uh, another important point here is that there is a synergistic effect between my male sex and age. And we can see that the effect of uh, age and male sex uh, increases in, in this case. And also in accordance to the figure that we saw earlier, uh, the effect of disabilities is also stronger in females as compared to what we see in males, even though it's, it's significant for both groups. Um, another point here is that the protective effect that is seen uh, in those with less than high school degrees is only seen in males. And income, uh, the, the effect that we saw that in the, having less than $35,000 uh, of yearly income was uh, associated with higher prevalence of cardiovascular disease was stronger in females in this case, and also in adjusted analysis. It was also significant in male, but not as stronger as compared to females. 
So in conclusion from, from these results, uh, uh, our results show that black participants participate from other race ethnicities, people older than, than 75 years and people with physical disabilities, but also people with low household income show higher, higher burden of cardiovascular disease. And importantly, sex might be a potent modifying factor of this association. So uh, we can see, we can also investigate further here for, because maybe there is a synergistic effect on gender disparities uh, with disparities across race ethnicity and other underrepresented groups. Of course, this is only a first step in, in the journey of, to investigate these, these disparities and further research is needed to try to disentangle where the social, cultural, economic, and possible biological determinants of these disparities and try to understand how the causal pathway is constructed. But uh, in addition to that, it's, it's very important to mention that concerted action is needed to tackle these disparities uh, because we, don't, we cannot just uh, keep uh, doing research and, and do nothing about this. So I think it, it's very important. And I read that uh, there's a very important article published in May uh, of this year, looking at how are, what are the next steps to try to work to tackle this, the disparities that we know exist in cardiovascular diseases. Uh, and of course, a very important takeaway of our research is that all of us provides a powerful resource to investigate disparities in health and provide evidence to help stakeholders make the decisions needed to address these disparities. With that, uh, I would like to thank the entire Falcone Lab, uh, and of course, my mentor, Dr. Falcone, who is uh, the leader of, of the lab, and of course, the Yale Stroke and Neuro ICU teams, and of course, our funding sources. I would like to thank you also for uh, listening. And now I can pass it over to Audrey, who is going to talk about uh, our other projects. Thank you very much. Thanks, Julian. Um, I'll go ahead and share my screen. Um, Julian did a fantastic job describing some of our projects, looking at the epidemiology of and disparities uh, in cardiovascular disease. And now I'll take you through a project where we used all of us um, with a hypothesis-driven approach to identify uh, novel risk factors for cardiovascular disease. Um, so the project I'm presenting here um, is uh, titled The Association of Lichen Planus with Cardiovascular Disease, a Combined Analysis in the UK Biobank in the All of Us Study. Uh, and this was recently published in the Journal of the American Academy of Dermatology. Um, so the background here, uh, lichen planus is a common T-cell mediated inflammatory skin disease that uh, has recently been associated with autoimmune diseases uh, and even some cardiovascular risk factors, including dyslipidemia. Um, in general, there's mounting evidence uh, from observational, genetic, uh, and interventional studies that indicates that inflammatory diseases do drive the development of atherosclerosis and cardiovascular disease. Um, and a good example of this is seen in prior research in psoriasis, um, which is another prevalent, prevalent T-cell mediated inflammatory skin disease that's morphologically related to lichen planus. Um, and it's been found that psoriasis is a known risk enhancer for cardiovascular disease. Um, and research in this area has actually changed the management of psoriasis so that now patients with psoriasis um, are aggressively screened and managed in cardiovascular risk factors uh, since they can develop cardiovascular disease earlier in life uh, and to a more severe extent. It has been postulated that other inflammatory skin diseases particularly um, might be associated with cardiovascular disease but up until this point, there have not been uh, large enough studies to really look at this association uh, from an epidemiologic perspective. So the objective of this study uh, was twofold. First, to determine whether lichen planus is associated with cardiovascular disease in two large cohorts. We use the UK Biobank in the All of Us Research Program. And then second, to determine whether age modifies the association between lichen planus and cardiovascular disease. Uh, to do this, we designed a three-stage study. First, we tested for the association between lichen planus and cardiovascular disease in the UK Biobank. We then conducted an independent replication in the US-based All of Us study. 
And then finally, we meta-analyzed the results using an inverse variance weighted random effects model. Um, our study population uh, included participants from both the UK Biobank and the All of Us study. The UK Biobank is a population-based study that enrolled 500,000 individuals uh, in the UK aged 37 to 73 uh, between the years of 2006 and 2010. The All of Us Research Program, as we know, uh, is a US-based study by the NIH that aims to enroll a diverse cohort of 1 million adults uh, from 2018 to present. And from each study, we included participants with available electronic health record data. Our exposure of interest was lichen planus, which we identified uh, using ICD codes and snowbed terms. And in all of us, uh, we used the OMOP concept IDs. Our outcome of interest was cardiovascular disease, uh, which we defined as a composite of ischemic heart disease and stroke. And we identified this in both studies using self-report and electronic health record data using validated ICD codes. Uh, we then used multivariable logistics regression models to determine whether LP was associated with cardiovascular disease in each study after adjusting uh, for known confounders. And then finally, we tested for statistical interaction uh, with age by adding product terms to our regression models. This table shows the clinical characteristics of the study cohorts. On this left side of the table, uh, we have data from the UK Biobank and those without and with lichen planus. And then on the right from all of us in those without and with lichen planus. Um, things to note here, in each study, there were about 800 participants with a diagnostic code for LP. Uh, in both studies, participants with LP were on average older, they were more likely to be female, um, and they were more likely to have cardiovascular risk factors, including hypertension, hyperlipidemia, diabetes, malignancy, and autoimmune disease. This table shows the prevalence of cardiovascular disease in the study cohorts, again, in the UK Biobank with or without and with LP and the same in all of us. Um, and what's kind of remarkable here is that the prevalence of cardiovascular disease among those with LP was very similar in each study, around 20%, whereas in those without LP, uh, it was fairly constant at around 10%. This table shows the main results of the study, uh, which shows the unadjusted and adjusted association between LP and CBD. We have the results for the UK Biobank, then all of us, and then the bottom line of this table shows the meta-analyzed result. Um, what's remarkable here is that the effect sizes seen are similar between both studies. And after adjust, uh, adjusting for known confounders um, and traditional cardiovascular risk factors, Patients uh, with a history of LP had a 37% increase in the odds of having cardiovascular disease, uh, and there was not significant heterogeneity between studies. Uh, this table shows the results of our interaction analyses with age. So we did find significant interaction um, of age and the relationship between LP and CVD. And this table shows uh, the results stratified by age group. What we can see is that the magnitude of the association between LP and CVD is much larger in the youngest age group and gradually decreases uh, with age. And we think this may be due to the accumulation of additional cardiovascular risk factors with age that may outweigh the risk of lichen planus. Uh, so to summarize, we found that cardiovascular disease is common among patients with lichen planus at around 20%. We found that LP is associated with cardiovascular disease independent of traditional vascular risk factors, and that the magnitude of this association was greatest in younger people. Uh, together, these results suggest that patients with LP may benefit from early and aggressive screening and management of cardiovascular risk factors, but further research is needed to determine whether this association is causal uh, and whether intervening with systemic treatment uh, may modify the risk of cardiovascular disease in this population. Um, I'd like to acknowledge all of my colleagues and mentors who helped work on this project, of course, the All of Us Research Program, and especially for having us here today, uh, and then our funding sources, the American Heart Association. I think we can stop there, and Julie and I would both uh, be happy to take any questions. Thank you so much for the presentation. Um, I have um, the chat open now for any questions that anyone has, or also you can um, raise hand or unmute um, if you'd like to ask a question. And I did put a link into um, the 
PubMed listing for the Lichen Planus uh, project. Um, that one didn't have a um, manuscript that I could link out to directly. We'd also be happy to generally answer questions or talk about our experience, um, you know, using the All of Us workspace, um, you know, any troubleshooting uh, or specific questions about the projects. We do have a question from Jay in the chat. Um, he says, um, comparing the UK Biobank and all of us, what is your sense of how easy or difficult it was to access and work with these data sets? Um, I'll start here, but then pass it off to, to Julian. Um, I think working in the, the all of us uh, workspace was really nice to have a central place to use all of that. Um, so I think that's nice, but uh, not so different from how we work with the UK Biobank data uh, in our research group too. Maybe Julian can talk a little bit more about that. Um, yeah, I think, yeah, both, both resources are, are very, um, very important to, to the biomedical research community. And certainly the UK Biobank has been uh, really impactful in the, all the research has been, that has been done to date. Uh, and I think, the All of Us research program is poised to be similar uh, from the US. Uh, we are still in the early days and we think that the, the approach of using a centralized uh, place to, to perform the analysis is, is very interesting and, and very useful because you don't have to uh, download the files or um, pre-process the file yourselves and, and have your own cluster to, to do everything. So I, I think it's very, uh, it's very good to, to work within the all of us uh, workbench. And yeah, we are anxiously awaiting the release of the, the generic data from the from the all of us, for example, which is I think is going to be uh, very good to, to continue our research because our lab in particular is, is focused on genetic epidemiology. Um, so yeah, I think all of us is still in the early days, but it's, it's supposed to become a very impactful uh, product program uh, for biomedical research. Yeah, kind of building off of that Larry's question, um, since we are still in the early days, um, did you guys have um, a learning curve as you started to learn the workbench or did you have any information about how um, that process was for you all to get started? Um, I, I can take this. Uh, so yeah, I think it's, it's, it's it was very interesting to, to start from the early days in, in all of us because uh, the resource, there was not much information about how to use the resource. There, there is a lot of kind of demos, notebooks that were very helpful to when we were starting to work with cardiovascular disease and trying to get the data. Uh, but the UK Bioban, by the time we started using it, uh, already was established and there was a lot of, a lot of, of the data preprocessing already done and available through uh, their search page. So I think that's one of the, the main challenges that remains uh, right now in all of us, but I think it, with time it's going to be, it's going to get better and better as researchers start to uh, return the results and they return the code and, and how the approaches that they use to, to ascertain different diseases. Uh, so I think it's going to be easier uh, in the future, probably. Yeah, yeah we do just, have... Oh, sorry, Audrey, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say that the resources in the user support hub and the online community um, have all been very helpful, too. That's good to hear. Yes. Um, yeah, we're trying to uh, keep that as robust as possible. And I think um, we are looking to um, hopefully getting some, some workspaces from... Uh, researchers shared, um, like you're saying, so that people can kind of see the methods and how the uh, data set is applied to projects. So uh, that should be coming in the future. Um, Sarah is asking, um, what was the biggest surprise in your research? Was there some synchronicity that was unexpected? Um, I can talk briefly about the, the Lichen Planus project. Um, I, we weren't really expecting to find such similar results with the UK Biobank, given that entirely different population, different part of the world, um, different time frames. So that was definitely interesting to see. Um, and I think it'll be interesting comparing these data sets going forward as there are more studies uh, kind of combining these for an international perspective. I'll, I'll be interested to see what comes of that. 
We got um, a question sort of following up with the Lichen Planus study. Um, would it be feasible and worth looking at the same data used for that study, but this time also looking into the difference of CV outcome prevalence while taking into account if the patients with LP are receiving treatment or not? Um, analyzing if treating LP has an important impact on the prevalence of CV disease. Uh, yeah, I think for a lot of these questions and more broadly, this, this field of looking at uh, inflammation-driven diseases and cardiovascular disease, that's kind of the question of interest. Um, for LP specifically, um, it's really only usually treated topically, um, and we're not sure what effect, if any, that might have on, you know, more systemic consequences. Um, so I think that in particular would be hard to look at in all of us, um, but we are actively looking into using um, the wealth of medication data available in all of us uh, to look at similar questions for other studies too. Other questions? From a support hub perspective, um, are there any other um, resources that you all feel would be helpful for researchers getting started or um, as they're continuing on their, their work within the workbench? Mm -hmm. One, one thing that comes to mind, but I think already it's there, when we were starting to work with this, uh, one of the questions I would have is um, from which point in time the different version of the data sets are getting uh, participants from. So I think at, at, at first this, this information was not widely available in, in the platform, but we did uh, ask and get the, the, the responses quickly in the user uh, hub. Uh, but I think right now there is already uh, somewhere in, in the documentation that uh, says where uh, the different versions of the research starts and ends. Um, and right now I think, yeah, uh, the, the things that, that were uh, pretty useful were, were the, the demo notebooks and, and um, that really helped to, to, to look at how to use the queries to get the information that we want. Okay. That's excellent um, feedback. And yeah, we try to um, update our materials uh, based on trends we see in questions coming through. And so, yeah, now we have that table that shows the uh, start and end dates for our CDRs and things. So, um, but uh, if anyone um, using the workbench ever has any suggestions for, for resources that they'd like to see, um, please do let us know. Um, I see there's a question from Ava for the LP study. Have you seen any indication that women may be more likely to report having LP as compared to men? Um, yeah, it's an interesting question. We definitely do see a higher prevalence uh, in women, whether that is because it's a biologic reason or maybe a reporting bias, maybe women are more likely to see dermatologists and have this diagnosed um, is is a little unclear, but I think an area uh, of interesting study, especially uh, then looking at, you know, sex disparities and cardiovascular disease too, that'd be interesting to see. And can you just clarify um, in lay terms what LP um, is and what, um, how you can spot if you have it? Yeah. Um, so lichen planus, um, it's a, it's a skin disease caused by inflammation. So T cells or immune cells in your body attack the, the base or the basal layer of your skin. And it causes an inflammatory reaction, um, that typically are stereotypically causes little purple papules, um, commonly in areas like on the wrists and the ankles, uh, that are usually itchy and bothersome. And it's typically, a, a relapsing recurring disease. So in times of stress or you know, triggers, it may get worse, and then it might go away for a while. Um, we're not sure exactly what causes it or what's the trigger to start this, this inflammatory or autoimmune phenomenon. Um, but I think that's being looked at too. Um, do you all have any plans um, for the future projects? Um, looking at this again, once maybe the control tier rolls out, is there any plans to, um, to further your research within the workbench concerning um, either of these two manuscripts? So yeah, we are actually waiting for, for the control tire to, to get the information. Two things first, um, I, I'm not completely sure what's going to be released in the control tire, but one of the things that are very 
important for our research and that is one limitation of our project in the in the disparities is the lack of availability of disaggregated uh, race and ethnic groups within the group that we explore. So for example, subgroups within, with, within Hispanic Latino participants and subgroups within, within Asian participants. Uh, when that becomes available with the control tire, I think it will, it will be interesting to explore in a more granular way this part across these subgroups because these are very heterogeneous groups that uh, may have different risks according to, uh, to this. So I think that's one of the things. And of course, um, the, the other obvious question that we that comes to mind when the genetic data is is, is really is to try to disentangle uh, what is driving these these disparities in cardiovascular disease. We know that, for example, for race ethnicity, so race ethnicity are social constructs, so there's a lot of social determinants in health involved in these disparities. But we want to be able to disentangle which part of of these disparities are caused by the social determinants and which parts are caused by biological, by biological factors and this may be uh, possible using the, this wealth of data that is available in, in all of us. Yeah, I think, um, you know, using the genetic data when it uh, becomes available to look into any of these questions um, from like an instrumental variable approach uh, will be key. Um, in terms of other projects that uh, we're looking at now, um, we're actually looking at uh, levels of cardiovascular risk factor control in patients who have had um, stroke and patients who have had myocardial infarction. Um, so that's you know, something in the pipeline um, using all of us to further look at cardiovascular disease disparities and what's being done now. Um, but yeah, I'm sure there will be a lot more coming from us soon too. <laughs> Yeah, and for um, those on the call who may not know, our um, controlled tier data is a, is a level um, above the registered tier that kind of um, gives more access to detailed information, more real level data. Um, things that are suppressed in the registered tier um, may be unsuppressed in the controlled tier. And um, we will give a full um, preview of that um, as soon as we're ready to release. Um, and that should be soon um, for the genetic information that will be whole genome sequencing and um, some array data. Um, and so uh, we're really excited and we're hoping um, to release that uh, later this year or early next year. Any other questions? I'm just scanning the chat to make sure I didn't miss anyone's questions. All right. Yes, Sarah, do you have a question? Go ahead and unmute if you'd like. Oh, you're just saying. Thank you. <laughs> okay, thank you. Yes, everyone, thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Acosta and Audrey, so much for presenting. If um, anyone on the call is doing some uh, research that they'd like to share, please feel free to reach out to us and we can um, talk about getting you scheduled. We'd like to do more of these scientific presentations with researchers in the workbench. Um, and so thank you so much for being the first uh, inaugural group to do this for us. We really appreciate it. Um, as always, we will post the recording of this session in case you'd like to revisit um, on the user support hub. And that is for registered tier users who um, have access to the workbench. Um, and also um, we'll look for uh, further announcements on the December um, office hours. Our next office hours would be during Thanksgiving, which will be canceled uh, due to uh, the holidays. So we look forward to seeing you back in December. Uh, again, if you have any questions, please reach out to the support desk at support at researchallofus.org. Um, and we thank you again so much, Julian and Audrey, for talking today.